checking out the new OnePlus 2, one of the most anticipated new phones of the year. And it's a sequel to one of my favorite phones of last year. So the premise here is still the same. This is called the flagship killer. In this case, it's the 2016 flagship killer. Ultimately, that means we have a phone with flagship specs and features without flagship pricing. Now, there are two variants of this phone with two different price points. So for 329, you can get a 16 gig version with three gigs of RAM, but for 389, you can get the version I have here, which gets me 64 gigs of internal storage and four gigs of RAM. And remember, there is no SD card expansion in this phone. Now, this is still a significant price jump from the previous generation, which started off at 250 and ended at 300 for equivalent sizes. But that price increase does come with some outstanding new features, such as a fingerprint scanner, a 13 megapixel camera with optical image stabilization capable of 4K video recording, along with laser autofocusing. This phone is also powered by one of the most powerful processors right now, the Snapdragon 810 version 2.1, which is supposed to resolve some of the issues, but of course, we're gonna take a look at that in this video. And we also get a more premium design. No longer all plastic, we have a metal frame along with the first USB Type-C connector I've seen on a phone this year. So getting to the fun part, the unboxing of the OnePlus 2, the box itself is a little more conventional. It isn't that slim box from last year, but we have these nice bright red OnePlus colors. So taking off the plastic, we can go ahead and lift the lid. And the first thing we see here is our plastic wrap OnePlus 2. Now the plastic wrapper actually shows us some of the features here, such as the volume controls, power sleep wake, the new alert slider, the headphone jack positioning, as well as the fingerprint sensor down below. Now no need to peel off this wrapper, the phone just slides out. So let's set the phone aside for just a moment so we can get to the accessories, which includes a literature packet. So inside the packet, we'll find a quick start guide, which highlights some of the major features, buttons, and that sort of thing. We also have a user guide, which includes all the regulatory information and warranty information. Below that, we'll find our accessories, which once again does not include a set of headphones. So the first thing we have here is the power adapter. Now, this is not a rapid charger, so it's pretty much a standard USB charger. The other big story with the OnePlus 2 is the USB Type-C cable. So once again, we have this flat style cable, red and white in color, and it comes with a fastener to tie it all together. So at one end, we'll find a USB type A connector, but this is a slim style connector, so it can be plugged in either direction. So like the USB type C connector, it's also reversible. And at the other end, we have our new USB type C connector replacing micro USB. Now, before we take a close look at the phone, let's boot up the phone for the first time and get it set up. Now, part of the initial setup process for the OnePlus 2 involves customizing our experience, all of which we can change later under settings. First up, we can go Nexus style and enable software or on-screen buttons instead of using the capacitive keys at the bottom of the device. But if you wanna preserve more screen real estate, you can leave this off. Next up, we can turn on some or all of the off-screen gestures that allow us to quickly launch the camera app, LED flash, control our media, or even wake up the device just by tapping the screen or drawing on the display. Swift key also comes pre-installed, but if you prefer to use the Google keyboard, you can select it here. And lastly, we can enable Shelf, which is a new feature still in beta, which I'll demonstrate in the software walkthrough. Taking a close look at the design, the phone itself picks up many of the characteristics of the original with the sandstone texture on the back. But this time we have a metal frame and it makes a huge difference here. As soon as you touch or handle the phone, you can feel the nicer, more rigid materials. I've always really liked the sandstone texture on the back. It's very grippable and feels durable. We can also remove the back panel on the OnePlus 2. We get this little thumbnail port along the lower right edge. So popping it off reveals not a whole lot underneath. No NFC, no wireless charging or anything like that. We just have this dual SIM slot. So we have this little tray which pops out and you can pop in your nano SIM. Now both trays do support 4G LTE. Along the front, once again, we have a 5.5 inch 1080p display with 401 pixels per inch. It's an LCD IPS panel, which has been improved for this generation. It's now brighter with more vivid colors and deeper contrast, and it definitely makes a difference. It's covered in Corning Gorilla Glass 4, which itself is covered in a screen protector, which you can peel off if you don't want it. Toward the top, of course, we have our earpiece along with our ambient light sensor and proximity sensor as indicated by the cutout here for the screen protector. We also have an LED notification light. It's either red or green. And then we have a five megapixel front facing camera, good for 1080p video. 
Down below, we'll find a very distinctive new feature here, which is a fingerprint sensor. But unlike the iPhone or the Galaxy S6, this is not a physical button. It's just a touchpad. So you can use this for scanning your fingerprint to unlock the device, and you also tap it to operate as a home button. On either side, we have these backlit capacitive keys, and they are assignable, so they don't have a specific shape or symbol associated with them. Uh, you can adjust these under settings, but by default, they act as back or recent apps. Along the bottom edge, front and center is the new USB Type-C connector, flanked by two speaker outlets, but only the right side is active, the other is just there for symmetry. Along the right side, we'll find our sleep-wake power button mounted below the volume rocker, and again, it's all metal, looks really slick. Along the left side, we have something called the alert slider, which is a three position switch. So the first position allows you to receive all your notification. The second position allows priority interruptions only, and the top position mutes all notifications except for alarms. Along the back, we have our very impressive and all new camera system, sporting a 13 megapixel sensor with an f2.0 aperture, optical image stabilization, laser autofocusing, which means that this camera can find focus more accurately and quickly in all lighting conditions. And of course, we have a dual LED flash. And at 1.3 microns, the pixels on this sensor are the largest of any 13 megapixel sensors out there, which lets a lot more light in for very impressive performance. Now compared to the OnePlus One, the OnePlus Two is slightly shorter, slightly narrower, but it is thicker and a bit heavier than the previous generation. But we still get a 5.5 inch 1080p display, but this time it's brighter with more vivid colors and it definitely makes a difference. Once again, we have the sandstone texture on the back, but this time it's a little more grippy or a little rougher on the OnePlus Two. I actually really like it. But of course, the big difference here is that we now have this metal frame surrounding everything. On the back, once again, we have a 13 megapixel camera, but this time we have optical image stabilization and laser autofocusing with a larger aperture so the optics look bigger. On the bottom, the smaller micro USB 2.0 port has given away to the larger USB Type-C connector, flanked by larger speaker grills milled into the metal. We can also see the volume key has joined the power button along the right side. I'm not a huge fan of this layout yet, I still have to get used to it, but sometimes it's hard to determine which button is which. That frees up the left side for the new alert slider, and they've eliminated the SIM tray. Toward the top, very similar design, but everything has switched sides here. And toward the bottom, obviously the big difference here is the new fingerprint scanner, which replaces the home button. And instead of the dedicated menu and back key, we now have these dashes which are assignable. And thankfully, the backlit keys are much brighter than before. Unfortunately and controversially, the OnePlus 2 does lose NFC, which the OnePlus 1 did have. Next up, I want to take a look at the interface, which is Android 5.1.1, skinned by Oxygen UI 2.0, which is OnePlus's skin over Android, which is fairly lightweight but does come with some interesting tweaks. In terms of the lock screen here, you can see we can double tap to wake it up. We also have our gestures, which includes a circle to launch into the camera app. You can see it launches pretty quickly. We can also launch the LED flash on the back or turn it off. We have other gestures for media, such as play, pause for playing back media. You can also advance a track or reverse a track using the arrow gestures. Also on the lock screen, we have quick shortcuts to the phone dialer or the camera app, which we can swipe up to launch into. Now the first thing I'm gonna show you here is setting up the fingerprint scanner. So I'm gonna to jump to settings. And if we look down here, we'll find fingerprint. So it's gonna tell us about setting up the fingerprint scanner. So all I have to do is press your finger here. So similar to other implementations, all I have to do here is press until it reads your fingerprint. So it's really quick and simple. We're gonna click finish. Now in order to use a fingerprint to unlock the device, we'll have to set up a password. So I'm gonna use a pin here. I'm gonna ask it to show all my notifications on the lock screen. And now I can go ahead and enable fingerprint unlock. So now if I go to wake up the device, you can see I have fingerprint unlocked enabled. All I have to do is tap and hold to unlock it. And it happens really quickly. Now you can also quickly unlock the device just by tapping and holding on the fingerprint sensor. It takes you to where you last left off. And of course this also acts as your home button just by tapping it. You can also double tap to launch into the camera app and you can configure this under settings. So otherwise it works extremely well and I will compare this to other fingerprint unlock devices later in this video. So in terms of the interface, very close to stock Android with our drop down notification shade and our expandable notifications or dismissible notifications and you can clear them all as well. We have our quick setting toggles which look close to stock Android but we do have a few tweaks here. So if you go up here, you can tap this to edit the toggles that appear here. So for example, you can turn on or turn off hotspot and you can turn off location or cast screen. You can also rearrange them if you want. Now, if you rearrange them, you can restore to default just by hitting the icon up here. Now, when you're done, click save and you're good. You can jump back here to restore whatever you lost. Getting back to the home screen, if you swipe all the way to the right, you get to this optional shelf feature, which includes frequently accessed apps, as well as frequent contacts. And of course, more will be added to this feature over time. You can also edit what appears here, so you can change your banner and more. 
We can also turn this off if you don't want it, so just tap and hold on the home screen to get to your editor. So we can go to settings, and under settings we can turn off shelf. From the screen you can also change the app drawer size. So we have standard, large at 6x5, or small at 4x3, and you can also change the icon pack if you have different ones installed. So let's go ahead and mess up our home screen a little bit here to show you the next feature under the editor. So we have rearrange. So this will rearrange our icons to tidy them up. This will work on both uh, home screens here. So all you have to do is navigate to them. And you can clear them all out. So if you want to remove this entirely or undo it. In terms of these Android navigation keys, we have our home button, which is capacitive, so you just tap it to take you back home. We also have our back button right here, and then we have our overview button. So the overview feature is pretty close to stock Android, but we do have a clear all button in the upper right. You can also tap and hold the home button to launch quickly into Google Now. Now we have several options with these navigation keys. So I'm gonna to jump to settings and go to buttons. So under buttons, we have lots of options such as navigation bar. So on-screen navigation bar restores a familiar interface uh, and that will turn off those capacitive buttons. Now I can also swap the buttons. So if you want your overview feature here and your back button feature here, you can do that. Now if you have the off-screen navigation bar, you can turn off the backlighting if you want. Now if you choose the on-screen navigation bar, you have the option to always enable the home button from that touchpad. So you can have both. You can have the home button here and the home button here, but if you don't want that, you can turn it off and now that just acts as the fingerprint scanner. If we enable these on-screen navigation keys, we do lose some flexibility here. So let's go and turn those off. So you can see we have several actions we can enable with these keys. So long press of the home button brings up the search assistant or Google Now. Double pressing will bring up the camera app and you can modify it here so you can change to whatever you want. That's also true of the recent and back button. So with the on-screen navigation keys enabled, we have a fairly familiar interface for launching Google Now, recent apps, and back. Now if we tap and hold the power button, we get to power off, reboot, or screenshot. So if you want to screen grab, you can grab it this way. Alternatively, you can just use the traditional method of volume down and power button at the same time. Now if you're watching a movie, listening to music, or playing a game, and you hit the volume keys, you get to your equalizer settings. So we have music mode, movie mode, and gaming mode. So you can disable the audio effects if you want or enable it, but it does make a huge positive difference with those speakers on the bottom. So we also have the option to jump right to our equalizer settings. So this is Audio Tuner. It's an app that came pre-installed, so you can manage the profiles for each mode. Now, if you're not using the speakers or audio in any way, you just get your notification volume. And if you want to adjust your Do Not Disturb settings here, you just use the switch along the side. Checking out the app drawer, it's fairly close to the stock, but if you look closely at the icon, it actually incorporates the OnePlus logo, which I think is pretty clever. Now the app selection is pretty close to stock Android. They've added a file manager, which works pretty nicely here, so you can see your entire file tree. We also have that audio tuner for managing our audio profiles. They've also added Swift keyboard, and this is where you can manage it if you want it turned on or off. Taking a closer look at the settings panel, you can see it is searchable like stock Android, so if you just want to search for your display settings, just start typing and then it takes you right to that panel. Of course, we have things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and since we have dual SIM cards, we have a page here for managing those dual SIM cards. We have buttons, which I showed you earlier, gestures, so you can turn off those gestures if you don't want them at all. So if you're accidentally triggering them, you can turn them off. Under storage, you can see how much space you have left available. And with 64 gigs, I have plenty. So you can see how many apps I've installed. Under battery, this is where you can see your usage timeline. We also have several options up here for displaying battery usage. So you can see the battery bar, battery circle, battery percentage, or battery hidden. So you don't want to see it at all. We also have multi-user mode, which you can manage here, so you can add new users or new guests from the screen. Under customization, we have dark mode. So dark mode will dim the color. So for example, the white display here is now black with cyan accents. Now this isn't across the entire device. So for example, the settings panel is dark. Uh, and if you go to the uh, drop-down notification shade, that isn't dark, but the app drawer is dark here. So there you go. We also have the Scion accent color. Right now you can't select different ones, but I guess if you add different themes, you can. And then we have the LED notification light, which we can manage here. Interestingly, Color OS does add app permissions. This is a feature that's coming with Android M, but it's available right now through Color OS. So if you want to manage the permissions granularly for each app, you can. Checking out the camera app, it's pretty simple. So you can tap anywhere on the scene to adjust exposure and focus, and we get this little manual exposure adjuster, which is very handy. We've seen this on many camera interfaces now. So we have settings up here, which includes clear image, HDR, and uh, beauty. Beauty softens the image, HDR exposures for dynamic range, and then we have clear image, which sharpens the image. We also have our timers. We have three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, or none, and then we have our flash settings. If we swipe in, we get to our settings toggle here. So we can check out our settings, such as photo resolution. So 12.4 megapixels is maximum, but it is four by three. So if you want 16 by nine, you'll have to step back. We also get our modes. So we have video mode, 
So let's check that out. So we can start recording video here. You can pinch in and out, and we do have continuous autofocusing, thanks to that laser AF system. And we have optical image stabilization, so it's nice and smooth even when handheld. We can snap photographs while recording video, and right now I'm recording in 4K. If you want to turn on the LED light, you can from this toggle right here. And of course, you can adjust exposure and focus manually. Now you can adjust the resolution up here. So we have 4K UHD, we also have 1080p Full HD or 720p. We also have panorama, slow motion, and time lapse. So images come out really clear and crisp, and with Laser AF, it's able to find focus accurately and quickly. So I'm really impressed by how crisp and vivid all my images come out from this camera, no matter the lighting conditions. The only complaint I might have is the fact that some colors tend to bloom like red, so they tend to kind of bleed. So maybe there's a little overexposure problem or oversaturation problem, but exposure is great. And color accuracy is also pretty good. The other issue I've noticed from otherwise excellent images is that when you have those depth of field shots in which the background is blurred. It tends to be overprocessed, so it doesn't look as smooth or natural as it should, but again, images come out really clear. 4K video is also clear and vivid with great exposure and bright, vivid colors. The only thing that's disappointing to me is that optical image stabilization isn't as smooth as I'd like to see. There appears to be no software stabilization either. But with laser AF, it's able to find focus on macro scenes pretty quickly and accurately, but it tends to hunt around a bit, so you'll see it jump around. But otherwise, it's a fantastic 4K camera. The low light performance of this camera is also excellent, aided by the laser AF system, which is able to find focus quickly and accurately in low light conditions, which is a challenge for most smartphone cameras. So exposure looks great, and the processing does a really good job smoothing out grain or noise in the scene, so it looks pretty natural. So I'm pretty impressed overall with the performance of this camera. It's definitely one of my favorites out there. In terms of benchmarks, we do see a pretty significant gain here over the previous generation. This also gives me a chance to show you the display difference between the OnePlus One and the OnePlus Two. It's a much brighter, more vivid display than before. So we have a single core score of 1214, multi-core score of 4418. That's really impressive. Now let's compare this to other flagships. Now side by side with the iPhone 6 Plus, you can see the iPhone does best it in the single core score, but the OnePlus with the octa-core processor is much higher. Now the Galaxy S6 has a slight edge over the OnePlus 2 in the same scores. But the OnePlus 2 edges ahead of the LG G4 in both scores. It also edges ahead of the HTC One M9, the only phone here also using the Snapdragon 810. In terms of performance, this is one of the best performing phones I've ever used. That's thanks to the Snapdragon 810, four gigs of RAM, and the near stock Android experience. The interface is really smooth and quick and games play flawlessly. So generally speaking, in terms of specs, this phone really keeps up. Now there are some fears about the Snapdragon 810 overheating. Now that really hasn't been the case for day-to-day -day use. The only time I run into heating issues uh, in which the phone feels warm to the touch or unusually warm to the touch is when I'm recording in 4K. But the OnePlus 2 is not unique in that situation. Many phones do this. In fact, many phones overheat while recording in 4K. And so far, I've been pretty lucky with this phone. In terms of the speed and accuracy of the fingerprint scanner on the OnePlus 2, it definitely beats the Galaxy S6 and iPhone 6 in terms of speed. In terms of accuracy, I do find that the iPhone 6 Plus is the best out of all three of them. But generally speaking, I rarely run into errors with the new OnePlus 2. With respect to battery life, this is one of my favorite aspects of the original OnePlus One. It was excellent. Now, in terms of the OnePlus Two, we're seeing a regression here a little bit. So it's down about 30 minutes from the OnePlus Two, which scored about four and a half hours at maximum screen brightness using a benchmark. Uh, that's still impressive results, although nothing really remarkable in the world of modern smartphones today. But of course, with a Snapdragon 810 processor, that's to be expected and battery life will improve as software updates are released. They've also notably improved the speaker quality of the OnePlus 2. Now it's not louder, but it is much clearer with more depth than before. The previous speaker sounded kind of tinny. So let's go ahead and take a listen. What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit board, checking out the new BlackBerry Passport Silver Edition, which is primarily a redesign of the original BlackBerry Passport, and it has a lot of design traits similar to the AT&T variant of this phone, but it's still a unique design. So we have this metal framework. So in the end, the OnePlus 2 is already one of my favorite phones of the year, thanks to a large, vivid display, pretty good battery life as well, a fingerprint sensor that works quickly and accurately, just like the other players in this segment that charge a lot more for it. The phone 
one is the perfect size, nice compact and feels rigid and durable with this nice metal frame which looks great and makes it feel like a premium phone. We also have this nice textured material on the back which adds to the grippability so I no longer feel a need to coat this phone in the case to make it more grippable. The camera is also excellent with a bright LED flash, a laser AF system that makes this camera ideal for low light conditions and generally delivers the performance of other high-end phones with 4K optical image stabilization with clear, crisp results that delivers accurate colors, good exposure, and smooth video. And of course, we have the smoothness of near stock Android running on a Snapdragon 810 with four gigs of RAM. Now it's not perfect. We don't have NFC, battery life is weaker than the previous generation, and of course, there's no rapid charging, which could benefit this phone, especially since it takes about two and a half hours or three hours to charge this from zero to maximum. But in the end, you get a flagship phone for a great price. So that's gonna do for me in this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next one.